All right, so um, pancreas is our third digestive support organ. And we've already discussed some of the endocrine function. Already discussed some of the endocrine function of the pancreas. It uh, was actually di digestive in nature because it helped out with glucose homeostasis. <laughs> Do you start every class that way? I mean, you start at every single A B one class that way. Is it you're allergic to the subject material or? I love What's that? I love the beginning. Oh, you love I just sneak every class. Just just happens. Just happens. All right. Could be worse. It must be me. Thank you. All right. So. Um, pancreas also has some exocrine function, and that means that we're going to find a duct, and we have a duct that travels down the middle of the pancreas, and that exocrine function is to excrete a solution into that duct that we call digestive juice, which is probably one of the top five grossest names in physiology. So the digestive juice or juices is a solution that's going to contain bicarbonate, and bicarbonate is going to help out with acid-base balance. Okay, so we're going to balance out uh, pH. We're going to neutralize acids. So from the stomach, as the stomach empties into the duodenum, that kind, that solution that's coming out that's your food that you just consumed maybe the last three or four hours ago, emptying into the duodenum, remember that we have a high acidic environment because we're trying to denature proteins so we can get enzymes in those proteins to chop them up. And as it empties into the duodenum, we lose the protection that we have in the stomach. And if we leave it really highly acidic, we would begin to work over the cells of the duodenum and, and denature their proteins and we begin to lose function. So the pancreas, through the common bile duct, the opening of the common bile duct, very close to the pyloric sphincter leading away from the stomach, we're going to add in this digestive juice that contains bicarbonate and we're going to neutralize that acid. And we're going to take it from being a real acidic solution to a neutral solution. Okay, we are going to shift gears now, and we're going to take a step back to the digestive tract and begin to look at its histology. So we've talked about gross anatomy, and we've talked about some of the basic functions of the uh, support organs. We're going to wrap around, we're going to come back in on this, but before we do that, we want to talk a little bit about the histology, specifically of the gastrointestinal tract. All right, so um, we're going to have four distinct layers of tissue. Four distinct layers of tissue that make up every portion of the GI tract, from the esophagus all the way through rectum and anus, all right? And those four distinct layers are going to have variation depending on where we are within, within the tract. So we're going to find them, all four of these layers, along the whole tract. And this includes the stomach. However, we're going to see that one of these layers in the stomach is a little bit different. And the way that we're going to work through the histology and through the different tissues that are present is from the inside to the outside. So what is the very inside of the tube going to be called? It's going to be the inside of the tube or, in, or an organ. So it's with an L. The lumen. So we're going to work from the luminal wall out to the exterior of the track. That says outer, yes. 
So the luminal wall is made up of a tissue that's called mucosa. So this is what's going to form the lumen or the luminal wall. In certain parts of the digestive tract, it's going to be through the mucosa that the nutrients that have been digested must cross. In order to enter our bloodstream. Okay, so the mucosa is going to be that first point of contact for the digested food for absorption. And so that means that the luminal wall is going to have to change. Because there are certain parts of the GI tract that we don't want to have food crossing or the, the nutrients crossing, or that they won't. Things like the esophagus. There's not a whole lot of point to try to begin to have nutrients cross <laughs> the luminal wall in the esophagus because we haven't digested the food enough, broken up, broken up. But as we enter into the duodenum, we now have that kind leading what? We have that kind that's leading away from we're like mixing up drinks back here. Gosh. Do you see what I have to deal with? Are you more well behaved than your sister? No. She's crazy. She's all behaved than she is. Okay. All right. So that luminal wall has to change, and we have to make it more receptive to the nutrients that have been broken down fully. So these changes that we see from esophagus through small intestine through enlarged intestine, it's a change in function which will lead to, a, or it's a change in form which will lead to a change in function. So the change induces various functions. And one of the major changes that we see as we move along the digestive tract is changes in total surface area. <coughs> so as you can imagine, the chyme enters and leaves the stomach, right? And as it enters into the duodenum of the small intestine, we're going to begin absorption. And in order for absorption to be optimized, it would be really, really great if we had a large area of contact for those nutrients to cross through the mucosal membrane into the bloodstream. So what you can see here, there's small folds and invaginations in the luminal wall. Those are going to be villi. And then the individual cells, so the luminal wall is going to have a bunch of folds as we go around, which invariably increases surface area. And then if we were to kind of zoom in on a little spot here and look at one of the cells, we're going to find microvilli in the luminal side of that cell that further increase surface area. Now, in parts of the small intestine where major absorption is occurring, there is so much surface area, so many villi and microvilli that the wall, the luminal wall in those areas looks sort of velvety, and so we call it a brush border. Leading out from the mucosa, we have the next layer, which is the submucosa, and the submucosa is going to be a layer of connective tissue. Okay, so we have this layer of connective tissue, and embedded in that connective tissue is going to be the site of major digestive vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. So this is the, the blood vessel supply here is, is major arteries, major veins leading into the mucosa 
where we're going to have our capillary beds. So intermixed within the mucosa is going to be the capillary blood supply where we have that major amount of exchange occurring from digested food into the bloodstream. Lymphatics and nerves, uh, we're going to have lymphatic supply to drain um, the mucosa, and we're also going to find that we're going to drain the lipids as well, which are our larger macromolecules. They're going to get incorporated into the lymph in a form of lymph called lacteal. Remember talking about this? You get that milky white substance. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about those lymphatics and the capillaries that extend into the, uh, into the mucosa from the lymphatic supply. And then the nerves are just simply going to regulate when digestion occurs, motility and movement, and things like that. So what's the arrow? I was just indicating that I was talking about blood vessels. Oh, yeah. The arrow is not really that important. The next layer out is going to be called the muscularis, and obviously this is going to be a muscle-containing layer. And as we go up and down the digestive tract, what we're going to find is there's going to be anywhere from two to three sub-layers or layers of muscle within the muscularis. And this is all smooth muscle. It's not skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. So these are going to be layers of smooth muscles. And the two to three layers is just simply going to be differentiated based off of orientation. So that we'll have layers of muscle oriented at different angles around the tube. Again, this is smooth muscle. In most of the digestive tract, we're going to have just two layers, an inner layer and an outer layer. In the stomach, we actually add a third layer, and it sits right in the middle in between the inner and outer layer. The inner layer is going to be a circular layer of smooth muscle. Okay, so a circular layer of smooth muscle. And what that means, the consequences here, is the fibers for the smooth muscle are going to be oriented around the tube. So fibers are oriented around the tube. And you can sort of see that in this picture here. If you come up to the board and see it better. But we're just simply going to have this layer of muscle where the fibers, they run, these would be the individual smooth muscle cells just oriented around the tube. So when they're triggered to contract and when they squeeze, the squeeze reduces diameter. Okay, so as they squeeze, they reduce diameter in a drawstring type squeeze. In a drawstring type squeeze. Now, most of the digestive tract has the inner layer and then also an outer layer. And that outer layer, the smooth muscle fibers are going to be longitudinal along the along the, the tube. We might call that lateral, I guess. That's supposed to be lateral. And so if this is our tube kind of oriented like this. The fibers kind of run in this direction. The cells would run in this direction. Now, when these fibers squeeze, they squeeze along the tube. And give a massaging type squeeze. So they're going to have more of a massaging type squeeze rather than a reduction in diameter. In the stomach is where we have our extra layer. It's going to be a middle layer. The stomach has an extra layer. It is 
middle between our circular layer on the inside and our lateral or longitudinal layer on the outside. And so we have fibers that run sort of like this, and then we have fibers that run sort of like this. This middle layer is going to be oblique, and it's going to just sort of be at an angle to the other two layers. So I'm going to just refer to that as a diagonal orientation. And that diagonal orientation, when it squeezes, it adds sort of a drawstring massaging type, kind of an intermediate between the two type squeeze. And really what it's doing for the stomach, remember the stomach is not only a storage site for the meal you just consumed, but it also squeezes on the food to mechanically break it down, <coughs> as well as chemically breaking it down. So it's going to just add just another vector of movement. So another vector of squeezing to be able to churn that food up and mix it well so that we can expose acids and enzymes to all different parts of the food that's just been consumed. The very top layer, which you can see represented here on the figure, is the serosa. Again, this is another connective tissue layer. And this covering, or this connective tissue layer rather, is going to be a covering or a sheath. Okay, so a covering or a sheath. And this covering is going to be partially protective. So partially a connective layer. Uh, but it's also going to add, or aid, aids as a point of contact to connect the gastrointestinal tract to the body cavity. So aids to connect the GI tract to the body cavity. In other words, the GI tract as it's set in your abdominal and pelvic cavities isn't just simply floating. It's just not simply just floating there in the body. Got it all? So that muscularis layer, what do you think it's going to do? It's going to do two things. It's going to provide some movement, and it's also going to provide a little bit of function. So after you take a bite out of your hammer, hamburger or whatever you have for lunch today, you swallow it. Once you swallow past the pharynx and put the food into the esophagus, you're no longer going to be able to swallow it down further. So it becomes an uh, autonomic process where we're going to move that food from the esophagus into the stomach, churn it up in the stomach, and then move it along to digest the rest of the digestive tract. Movement of food, by the way, we're going to call a bite of food, we're going to call that a bolus, B-O-L-U-S. We move the bolus along from one point of the digestive tract to another point of the digestive tract, and the term we use there is motility. So you want to have a decent amount of gut motility to help facilitate not only the movement of the bolus, but the breakdown mechanically of the bolus to facilitate chemical breakdown of the bolus digestion, and then also to facilitate exposure to a high surface area within the small intestine to facilitate absorption. 
now in addition to swallowing, there are two main types of motility. And this is a picture of one of those types of motility. You see that this is actually going to be in the esophagus. This is what's known as peristalsis. So peristalsis. And peristalsis is going to be used to move food forward along the digestive tract. So we're going to use this to move food forward. Okay, so our, our bolus or our lump of food is going to enter the mouth, be swallowed, and forced into the first part of the GI tract. So forced into the GI tract. Now, what you can see here is that bolus, as it enters into the esophagus in this case, it creates a stretch. So you swallow, that food gets forced into the esophagus, and it causes the tissue of the esophagus to stretch. That's going to be a stimuli. So it stretches the tissue, and that stretch again is a stimuli. So it acts as a stimuli. That stimuli is going to cause two things to happen, which you can see illustrated here in this figure. You're going to have something happen behind the bolus, and you're going to have something happen around and uh, before the bolus. The smooth muscle that we find in the muscularis behind the stretch, so we just swallow the food in, what's happening behind that stretched tissue is smooth muscle contraction. Okay, so smooth muscle contraction does Smooth muscle cells are stimulated to contract, and this is just like squeezing on a tube of toothpaste. You squeeze right in the middle of the tube of toothpaste, and all of the toothpaste goes up towards the nozzle and will begin to spray out. I guess it doesn't really spray out, unless you're a gorilla. <laughs> it's a kind of a weird thought. Uh, the smooth muscle. <coughs> immediately in front of the bolus, so in this area here, it's going to undergo relaxation. And hopefully you're beginning to realize that we're setting up the pressure. We've got high pressure behind it from the squeeze, low pressure in front of the bolus because of the relaxation, and the bolus is going to act just like a fluid, and it's going to begin to move towards the relaxed portion of the tube. Now, as this happens, it causes a wave as the bolus is moved along, travels along the tube. So we have this wave. So the, the esophagus sort of waves as the bolus is, is moved along, okay? And as many boluses move along. So contraction and relaxation, contraction and relaxation as we move along. So it looks like it's sort of moving in this wave-like motion. We refer to that as the parasympathetic <laughs> wave. peristaltic wave. This is actually visible in GI ultrasound. You can actually see that movement. 
And it's also going to be audible. You can hear it with a stethoscope. That's some of the stomach sounds that they're listening to. But when your stomach is really empty, you actually can also hear peristalsis. When the stomach is empty, the small intestines peristalsis reverberates up to the empty stomach, gets amplified, and you can hear it audibly. That would be your tum tummy rumbling. So it's not necessarily an indication that you're hungry, it's just an indication that your stomach may be empty. And when I say hungry, I mean satiated. It, it's not directly related to a low nutrient supply. It just is related to your stomach being empty. You may have had a big enough meal that you have a nutrient supply in the last few more hours once your stomach starts to rumble. Most of us pick up on that, right? Just because it's an audible cue. By the way, does anyone happen to know the scientific term for tummy rumbling? Growling? <laughs> tummy growling? That's right. That's correct. You're now, congratulations, doctor. That's all we really know. That's the extent of digestive. That's borgerigma. What? Borgerigma. I don't know. Borgerigma. <laughs> How about uh, chewing? Does anyone remember that? Mastication. Mastication leads to borgerigma. Doesn't really bite. I mean, it sounds kind of neat. It sounds like you're really smart. I drank some fluid and it caused me to mix right. You going to mix right right now? <laughs> okay, we have another type of another type of um, gut motility. It's called segmentation. This is going to occur primarily in the small intestine. And where peristalsis was unidirectional, just in one direction, segmentation is actually going to be in two directions. And, and what you can see happening here, we have a couple different boluses, and we've, we've just covered, colored them for reference. This is not a real picture, just so you're aware. So as you randomly squeeze or segment the small intestine, that random squeezing all over begins to mix up that kind in each of those little boluses that are being deposited through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine. And you squeeze them up kind of at random and they get all mixed up. And as they're getting all mixed up, you are continually circulating the... It's all awkward. How to go in there? <laughs> You're continually mixing up the, the kind. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a problem. You're continually mixing up the chyme so that you can expose the chyme to the brush border and circulating all of it up to the brush border to facilitate um, really good absorption of those nutrients that have been digested and broken down. So it's primarily in the small intestine. It comes from random smooth muscle contraction. So random smooth muscle contraction causing that bolus to be where the bolus is to be squished back and forth. And again, we're doing this as we kind of mix everything together. Those boluses are going to circulate up towards the smooth muscle surface or towards the uh, uh, luminal surface. And that's going to stimulate absorption. That stimulates nutrient absorption. Anybody 
doing all right? All right, so let's talk a little bit here about uh, stomach function. We know a little bit about the motility and the function that arises out of this motility. Let's specifically look at the stomach, because the stomach has got some really interesting stuff going on. Uh, but before we totally get into the stomach, uh, let's take this step by step and lead into the stomach. So food comes into the mouth. And your mouth is going to be a food processor. And your teeth are involved in that food processing process. We're going to chew up the food, which begins to mechanically break the food down. Also, that salivary amylase, the enzyme gets mixed in, and we begin starch digestion, starch breakdown. So we're breaking it down in the mouth mechanically and chemically. And we're going to swallow that down. It goes through the esophagus, transports from the esophagus to the stomach through the upper esophageal sphincter by way of peristalsis. So we have that peristaltic wave that pushes it along and deposits it into the stomach. So the esophagus is going to, that's not supposed to be a dollar sign. <laughs> 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 it's actually pronounced esophagu money. <laughs> so your esophagus is going to deliver food to the stomach, and that really is, that's the money spot right there, delivering food into the stomach, stopping borgerigma. <laughs> and every, every, every other joke I told you, they all into one big one. <laughs> so the esophagus delivers food into the stomach, and that food has been partially broken apart, partially mixed up with the enzyme amylase to begin chemical digestion. So by the time it gets to the stomach, and you've probably experienced this before, it's not really any different than when it was sitting on your plate. If you throw up mashed potatoes, they still look a little bit like mashed potatoes. It, it's immediately following a meal. <laughs> so what we deliver into the stomach is still pretty food-like. But as we enter into the stomach, things are going to change drastically. So here you can see those three layers of muscle from the muscularis oriented in different directions. We have our longitudinal layer, our circular layer, and then that oblique layer. Inside of the stomach, the stomach can expand. Anyone remember how much food we can take in a meal? Three liters. Three liters. Very good. So it's going to expand. The inner surface of the stomach has these things called rugae that are folds of the mucosa that are going to allow some of that expansion to occur. So the stomach is going to be a muscular and expandable sac. <coughs> So this allows storage, and whenever we consume a meal, it takes that meal bolus. And we can expand up to about three liters to hold about three liters. Now, I don't recommend that you load your stomach up with three liters of food every time you does your stomach really like expand and stretch with the amount of food that you eat and like stay that way unless you shrink it? Does that make sense? Like you know how well, like, what do you mean by it? Unless you, know you shrink it? No, I'm saying like like by by your food portion, by your food portion. Like some people say that I oh. eat a lot. Your, your stomach, like your stomach expands out and then yeah. it doesn't get as small as it Yeah. Isn't that why I like basketball? Oh, I'm not sure. 
It's the same people who are telling you that your stomach gets really, really big and it doesn't expand out are probably the same people who are doing their diet cleanse. <laughs> here she comes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the stomach will expand <laughs> with a meal and then it will shrink back down. Gastric bypass is to reduce the size of that usable sac. They actually bypass the stomach. So I thought it was they, they can create a much, much smaller pocket and they bypass the rest of the stuff. So, why do people have that? Why can't they throw up anymore? Oh, they still can throw up. Some people may not be able to. Um, maybe, I don't know. The emanation reflex usually doesn't go away. But they actually, they a lot of times throw up because they'll consume, they, they'll have like, instead of three or four cups of food, they can fit in like one cup in their pouch. And, yeah, in their pouch. And I don't know, I mean, I don't think I need gastric bypass and I hope I never do. But I'm thinking that if I had it, they're like, okay, you can only eat a, a cup of food, I'd be like, I'm going to see if that's true. <laughs> They tell you you can't eat things that are really good, like cheese and like all the really good food. And yeah, so just. So, like, it's not true when people say, like, oh, you can't eat this because it's not true. Yeah, and we have empty left legs as well. If we can eat a lot, oh, you must have an empty left leg. All right, thanks, Grandma. <laughs> no, um, the stomach. <laughs> it may be more of a neurological effect than an actual physical effect of the stomach. And the stomach, you know, it's it's got a high nervous nervous system supply. And as the stomach expands, that nerve system, there should be a feedback loop back on the higher brain centers that help out with satiety to say, okay, you're full. And if you have been on a diet for a prolonged period of time, you may put a lot of food in there or more than you're used to. And, the, and, and that signal has kind of been reset. Your set point's been reset. And so the brain says, oh, you're, <coughs> you're full. You don't need to eat any more food. So instead of being able to eat three burritos, and you can now eat one burrito, it's because of your brain, not because of your stomach. Sure. Three burritos? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and is burrito your favorite food? No, I don't like burritos. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> You've never heard of the empty left leg? Oh my gosh. You can put them, shove them down there and you're good to go. I was always told that I had an empty left leg because I used to go eat a lot of food. I still can eat a lot of food, but I shouldn't eat a lot of food because, you know, the opposite of food is exercise. And if you don't exercise, then. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get stored someplace, right? It's either going to be used or it's going to get stored. And we used to have contests, me and my cousin. My cousin bought 10 years younger than me, so you know who always won these contests. But at Thanksgiving time, we would have contests to see who could eat the most food. And so we weigh ourselves before and we weigh ourselves afterwards, and I gained like 20 pounds one year. <laughs> and I sat around for like three days just like, I don't want to eat turkey anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't eat. I ate like one meal, and then for three days, I was just like, "Don't touch me. <laughs> Leave me alone." <laughs> and so yes, they said, "Where are you putting all of that? You must have an empty left leg." <laughs> 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 it was a lot. I don't recommend it. The point is that maybe three liters is 20 pounds. I don't know. But it can expand. And then after the meal, it begins to shrink as food is slowly delivered into the small intestine. 
So this slowly shrinks post meal. As we deliver the meal into the small intestine after we've broken it down and digested it. All right. So, um, in addition to its massive storage capacity, it's also the stomach's also going to aid in digestion. Um, and in fact, the stomach turns out to be a very important site for protein digestion. And part of the reason that it's such an important site for protein digestion is remember that protein has a native conformation, and usually that's kind of protected all balled up either in a globular protein or snapped into the cell membrane. And the way to get it out of that native concentration is either to increase temperature or we can decrease the pH and increase the acidity. So the stomach is going to have the ability to uh, withstand strong amounts of acid and helps to denature proteins so that those proteins can be chopped up by by enzymes, protein degrading enzymes. Uh, the strong acid that's in the stomach does another thing for us as well. It's going to help to kill bacteria that enter from your diet and make their way into the digestive system. So who, who's, who's worked in the emergency room over the summer? You have? Did you have an increase in the number of cases of gastrointestinal distress? People coming in that are like food poisoning. Uh, so, over the summer? Well, so I did it like the day of the break. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay, so this is what's associated with that inner layer of the gastrointestinal tract called the mucosa. And if we were to look at the surface of the stomach, it would look something like this, and then this is a blow-up of what you're looking at there. So this is our mucosal membrane, and the mucosal membrane contains millions of small pits. Okay, so we have these small little pits, they're called gastric pits, and they litter the mucosal surface of the stomach. Now those pits, they lead down into the gastric pits, lead to gastric glands. So gastric pits lead to gastric glands. And these gastric pits are going to function to produce a cocktail. So they produce a cocktail of protein digesting enzymes. Now the gland is lined with a bunch of different types of cells, and I want you to know about three types of cells. And those three types of cells we will pick up on Friday. Friday, and we'll have our next exam come up here on Wednesday. <laughs> Oh, he said, this is the way out.